various dimensions of Jesus' suffering is inspired by the theologian Manfred Köhnlein and his research on Jesus' passion and resurrection. Suffering has many faces. No one suffers in the same way. Charles Uncosi's Linocut attempts to capture the suffering and pain of Mary and Joseph. He does so in the South African context of 1976. Living in Soweto, he experienced the pain of parents who did not know where their children are. Are they still alive? Will they find them injured, possibly lying in a hospital? Joseph holds his arms across his chest, as if trying to protect himself from the pain. Mary tries to wipe away her tears seeing yet not be bearing to see. Suffering can be brief or involve a long process. It usually raises the question of responsibility. Who is to blame? Could it be avoided? Very often there is no one clear and simple answer. There is physical, mental and social suffering. On a daily basis we witness how people suffer because of wars poverty or natural catastrophes. Suffering is inflicted by cancer, the loss of loved ones or unjust structures. We suffer God's absence, grapple with our own fate or guilt, despair of our fellow human beings or lose confidence in ourselves. Suffering can feel like a sudden attack or can be something we expected. Our responses to suffering also vary. We try to alleviate the pain by attending to it or suppressing it. We desperately want to make sense of it. Others try to comfort us by offering an explanation. We find ourselves between welcoming their support and resisting their counsel. We might seek expert advice, but ultimately only the one who suffers should have the final interpretative authority. But this in itself can be an overwhelming burden. It is pain that drives suffering in a sense of hopelessness that causes distress. Some of those who endure such suffering and pain feel that they no longer truly know themselves. They realize that they are running out of time. What is unfinished wants to be completed. There is the desire to make up for what was neglected and to undo what went wrong in the past, but it might be too late. What will one encounter when crossing the inner landscape of one's emotions? 
There are the deserts of bitterness and the meadows of gratitude, the mountains of anger and the rivers of hope. Emotions can be unpredictable. At one moment, we might be thankful for a caring hand. Seconds later, we lash out in frustration. There are those who lose faith in those who somehow manage to feel held in a greater love. Some find a place of acceptance within themselves. Others remain trapped in fierce rebellion, fighting against what cannot be altered. Both trust and despair might meet each other in the cry that keeps echoing through world history. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We cannot but address the one we feel we have lost. From a mental or spiritual perspective, hope is the most important medication in suffering. As long as there is hope, Unexpected strength can be mobilized. To have hope is to not give up, to believe in people's goodness, the achievements of technological progress or a miracle from above. But hope can also take the shape of holding on to the belief that dying is but a passage to a more peaceful and beautiful state of being close to God. To know that we cannot fall any deeper than into God's hands allows us to think of death not just as a threat, but also as a doorway to new life. We are delivered from the present distress and pain and welcomed into the safety and certainty of God's eternal love. Personal suffering confronts us with a difficult choice. We are compelled to speak with Joseph Campbell, to let go of the life we planned so as to accept the one that is waiting for us. Our Christian tradition points those who suffer to the sufferings of Christ. We encourage to identify with the crucified Christ as the archetype of the forsaken and despairing victim who in the end experiences deliverance and salvation. Jesus' public ministry might have lasted only a year and his passion in Jerusalem only a few days. No other influential personality in the history of religion was probably as pressed for time as he was. The Passion of Christ presents us with a basic pattern of anguish and agony. To behold the suffering Christ is to be present to all the different dimensions of suffering. With his conversion on the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul had to let go of the life he had planned in order to welcome the one waiting for him. He leaned deeply, deeply into the crucified and risen Jesus, this anti-imperial figure. And at the heart of Paul's anti-imperial gospel was his proclamation of Christ crucified, which in the end took him to Rome, the heart of empire where he too was executed. But Paul's Christ crucified keeps countering the ancient and imperial view of redemptive violence. The cross became Rome's imperial no to Jesus, but in raising Jesus to life, God said yes to Jesus, vindicating everything Jesus stood for. Resurrection was God's powerful no to the powers that executed Jesus, and God's triumphant yes to Jesus' nonviolent resistance. Journey by journey, congregation by congregation, letter by letter, the Apostle Paul is dedicated to proclaim Christ crucified. For Paul, Christ crucified reveals the power and wisdom of a God who chooses justice and not violence to bring genuine peace to the world. Paul therefore writes to the congregation in Corinth, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to realize that we are entrapped in the self-destructive dynamic, responding to violence with violence, an endless cycle driven by fear and a desire for domination. It is only by confronting the darkness within ourselves 
at both the personal and the societal level that we will be able to forge new pathways to peace through justice and not violence. But to carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to also keep remembering the various dimensions of his suffering, provoked by his resistance to the lies of redemptive violence. The first dimension of Christ's suffering was mental disappointment. Jesus must have been disappointed and disheartened by the resistance of the religious elite to his ministry and vision. He was accused of breaking the Sabbath and of turning against the temple institution. It did this for the sake of the marginalized and exploited. But the religious leaders carefully guarded the status quo and were determined to keep the peace with imperial Rome. It was during his final visit to Jerusalem that Jesus must have realized that his life was increasingly at risk. Reflecting on the fate of Israel's prophets, he reveals his deep disappointment and disillusionment with the big cities. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Would the same fate await him? To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to ponder the mental disappointment about the way our big cities resist change and transformation. The second dimension of Christ's suffering was psychological distress. Jesus had to suffer misunderstandings, betrayal, mockery and multiple accusations. He was caught in between the messianic expectations of his followers who cheered him into Jerusalem as the long-awaited Davidic saviour figure who would finally liberate them from Roman oppression. But in contrast to the pilgrims entering Jerusalem with him, Jerusalem's citizens seemed more reserved and even hostile towards him. They did not want a troublemaker in the city. This wouldn't be good for business and interrupt the usual festivities. The city's unease should not surprise us. A quick glance at the group of disciples that made up the inner circle reveals that many of them must have had a dubious reputation. There was Simon the Zealot, a member of a resistance movement. The brothers John and Jacob had the nickname Sons of Thunder, which might also indicate that they were associated with some underground movement. Judas's second name was Ishariot, which means the Dagger Man. He might have belonged to the Jewish Sicarii, possibly the world's first political terrorists who actively rejected Roman dom dominance over Judea and used assassination and kidnapping to incite a Jewish uprising against Rome. And then there was Peter, who said to have carried a sword with him. We also need to remember that a resistance movement centered around a Galilean and entering Jerusalem must have evoked great suspicion. It must have brought back the memories of another Galilean rebel. In 6 CE, Judas the Galilean incited the public by announcing that God needed to be helped to assume power and control. He called upon all Jewish citizens to stop paying taxes to the Romans. But Judas the Galilean 
had been quickly arrested and executed. No wonder that Jesus became seriously distressed and perturbed when his inner circle of disciples kept raising messianic expectations. On the way to Jerusalem, they began debating about who would sit beside him once he assumed the royal throne and ushered in the kingdom of God. Jesus tried hard to counter those expectations by reminding them that he did not come to rule but to serve. To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to ponder the psychological distress that arises when confronted with expectations one will not be able to fulfill. It takes a lot of courage and strength to remain true to oneself. The third dimension of Christ's suffering was physical pain. Jesus was arrested, bound, beaten and crucified. Bodily sufferings cause pain. The pain threshold is different from person to person. Physical pain affects one's soul and self-awareness. It can paralyze one's ability to remain resistant. Pain can rob us of our senses and make us thirst for something to numb the pain. Having been beaten and nailed to the cross, Jesus was thirsting for a sip of vinegar to at least wet his lips and tongue. In the end, he could not but cry out in pain and despair, having lost all hope and trust, not just in people, but also in God. We should never make someone's salvation dependent on how one dies. Everyone dies their own death. Some are able to die peacefully, others cry out in pain and agony and lose hope and faith. Enormous pain can make it difficult to stay in the body and to remain true to oneself. One can come to a point where one is completely beside oneself. Jesus' physical suffering is said to also reveal God's unreserved identification with our human existence. John's Gospel emphasizes how in Jesus God truly became one of us, sharing not only in the joy and beauty of life, but also suffering the fragility and vulnerability that comes with being bodied beings. No other world religion is said to have included the sufferings of its founder in such an honest, bare and unadorned way. It emboldened Christians to address Jesus in their prayers as their brother, the one who knows what it means to experience suffering in all its different dimensions. To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to acknowledge the terror of physical pain, but also to remember that in Jesus God was committed to share even the most extreme forms of the kind of violence human beings are willing to inflict on each other. fourth dimension of Christ's suffering is social isolation. Suffering unjust structures and systems can make one either aggressive or withdraw in resignation. But given today's world of social media and the choice of multiple channels of communication, social isolation can easily be avoided by being more aware of and attentive to those who feel cut off from life. Jesus had to experience such social isolation only towards the end of his life. Of course, from the beginning he had to suffer people's incomprehension and rejection, but he always found himself embedded 
in a network of support. There was his family, his teacher and mentor John the Baptist, the inner circle of disciples, the crowd of people who sympathized with him, those grateful for being healed and restored, and finally those who were keen to listen to him and welcome him into their homes. The one constant in his life was his intimate connection with the God he lovingly addressed as Abba. But with time, his closest friends and allies did not just support and appreciate him, but also forsake and disappoint him. The passion stories are also a psychological textbook about how one can be suddenly alone and isolated despite close friendships in the past. It is in moments of crisis that one discovers who one's true friends are. They are those who shun and betray you and those who are not afraid to stand by you. When Jesus gathered his disciples for a final meal, sharing the bread and the cup, he must have already noticed the growing tensions among his inner circle of supporters and friends. Was the sh shared meal not his final desperate attempt to bind them together in love and solidarity? And yet it was during this meal that he announced that one of his friends would betray him. The disciples' response is one of surprise and outrage. They could not fathom the possibility of betrayal. To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to reflect on the pain caused by social isolation and the possibility of betraying those we love. The fifth dimension of Christ's suffering is spiritual agony. To what extent can we tolerate that Christ did not just suffer the rejection and betrayal of his friends, but in the end also felt forsaken by God? And while he did not question the existence of God, he did suffer God's painful absence. In a last despairing attempt to be heard by his God, Jesus cries out on the cross to his God, who seems removed and indifferent. In Mominkosi Zulus etching, the ravens reverberate the desperate cry for help. Their loud and confused agitation stands in stark contrast to the resignation we notice in the face of Jesus and his followers. We are reminded of Psalm 88, the only psalm that ends in darkness. They and night I cry out to you. I am overwhelmed with troubles, and my life draws near to death. You have put me in the lowest pit, in the darkest depth. You have taken from me my closest friends, and have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call to you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? You have taken from me friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. Suffering robs life of its freedom, orientation and direction. It affects body, mind and soul in all the life-giving relationships. It darkens, it darkens one's faith and makes one cry out for God's justice. In the end, suffering silences. One might be able to cope with suffering if it includes one or two dimensions. But once it extends into multiple dimensions, it can lead to a collapse of meaning and being. Jesus will have anticipated to be abandoned by his friends, but he did not expect to be forsaken by his God. To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to bear the pain of prayers spoken but not heard and ending in darkness. In the last days of his life, Jesus is engulfed by all five dimensions of suffering. He is not spared mental disappointment, psychological distress, physical pain, social isolation and spiritual agony. 
To carry around in our body the death of Jesus is to remember and ponder all these dimensions of suffering. It is to identify with those who, because of their commitment to justice and their resistance to evil, are also experiencing all those dimensions of suffering. But according to the Apostle Paul, we are not just remembering and pondering such suffering. Such remembering and pondering is also done so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. It is a kind of Easter hope that reveals and affirms the nonviolent way of Jesus as the only one that is able to liberate us from those ideologies that continue to pursue redemptive violence. Jesus' resurrection is God's yes to the way of Jesus and God's no to the forces and powers that caused Jesus' suffering and violent death. And so we keep praying and hoping that more and more people will feel compelled to let go of the path that leads to death, ready to welcome the new life that is waiting for them and to truly become what the early Christians were called, people of the way. And so on this journey, God bless you and keep you. God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Amen. Down in the river to pray, steady.